और इसमें हम उद्घाटन सत्र के बाद में पेनली सेशन में सभी उपस्थित है आप सभी विद्वान विदुषी और सभी बंधुओं का स्वागत है मैं आप सभी का भारत विद्या परियोजना और वेब्स की ओर से हार्दिक अभिनंदन और स्वागत करता हूं। मैं सबसे पहले इस प्लेनरी सेशन के लिए अध्यक्ष अध्यक्षा के रूप में डॉक्टर शशि बाला मैम को आमंत्रित करता हूं कि वो आए और मंच की शोभा बढ़ाए आप भारत विद्या भवन में भारतीय विद्या भवन में डीन है सेंटर ऑफ इंडोलॉजी की और इस सेशन के आप अध्यक्षा के रूप में हमारे समक्ष विराजमान हैं हम सभी का सौभाग्य है और स्पीकर के रूप में मैं आमंत्रित करूंगा फ्रांस से पधार रहे डॉक्टर कॉम गोपेंटर डी जॉर्डन सर का कि वो आए और मंच पर पधारें प्लीज कम डॉक्टर कॉम गोपेंटर डी जॉर्डन सर ऑन द स्टेज मोस्ट वेलकम सर आप वक्ता के रूप में यहाँ उपस्थित हैं आपका भी हार्दिक अभिनंदन और स्वागत आपका विषय है द वैदिक फिलोसफी ऑफ एथलेटिक्स इसी के साथ में मैं हमारे समक्ष उपस्थित प्रोफेसर ललन प्रसाद सर को आमंत्रित करता हूँ कि वो आए और मंच पर आसीन हो आप यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ दिल्ली में बिजनेस इकोनॉमिक्स के फॉर्मर डीन है और हमारा सौभाग्य है कि आप हमारे समक्ष उपस्थित हैं आपका विषय है आर्ट ऑफ अर्निंग एंड स्पेंडिंग इन वेदास आपका भी स्वागत और हार्दिक अभिनंदन सर फिर भी आप पढ़ा रहे मैं सर्वप्रथम आमंत्रित करूंगा थान से पधारे हुए विद्वान डॉक्टर कॉम कॉर्पेंडेंट डी जॉर्डन सर को कि वो आए और अपना वक्तव्य प्रस्तुत करें मोस्ट वेलकम सर प्लीज कम या पीपीटी तैयार है सर Waves and the uh, Indira Gandhi National Center for the Arts for inviting me. Uh, I will not claim to lecture such a learned audience about uh, Indian uh, theory of art per se, because that would be pretentious. And uh, unfortunately, as we have heard, uh, it has become a habit for some Western scholars to teach Indians about their own tradition, which uh, is not always. Uh, the most uh, accurate way to portray it. But what I would like to do in these 20 minutes is to briefly review the context of aesthetics as part of human history and, and human philosophy and situate the Indian tradition uh, in that context and show in what way it is universal and in what way other traditions have deferred with it at some point or another and that explains also perhaps the widening gap uh, which has been growing over a few centuries between India and uh, the West in particular. So I will start by saying that aesthetics is of course a Greek word, but it is actually derived, derived from a Greek word. And it appears first around 1730 uh, in the writings of a German philosopher called Baumgarten. 
and it was very quickly picked up by Kant and other major philosophers. It is a theory of art and beauty. Now, you know, somebody has said, Barrett Newman, I think, has said that, uh, or, uh, you know, aesthetics is to beauty what ornithology is to the birds, in the sense that uh, when you're talking about a theory, you're not talking about the real thing. Beauty is experiential. Uh, just like, in fact, all of, uh, you know, all of Vidya is ultimately experiential. And in particular, Paravidya is experiential. It's not to be described, it is to be alluded to. But when it is Avyakta, obviously there is no such uh, actual definition of it that can be ultimately valid. However, we have had uh, over the centuries, over many centuries, uh, on the one hand, a number of, a varying concept of beauty, uh, and many attempts to define it. And uh, if you, of course, look at uh, aesthetics itself, it comes from aesthes, which in Greek means sense, sensation, which is in turn uh, derived from hasta, which is the limb, the sensing organ. So aesthetics is, of course, what you perceive, what you sense, with any of your senses, and ultimately with your mind, with manas and, and uh, you know, buddhi. But uh, it comes through the eyes, it comes through the hand, and it comes to both the nyanendriyas and the karmendriyas, which means it's uh, what you perceive, but it's also what you make, what you create. And that is, of course, uh, the dichotomy between uh, Prakritic nature, things as they are, uh, the Buddhists say Buddha Tathatha, and what you actually make, the fine culture, Atma Sanskriti, which of course in general means a refinement of the soul and leads to uh, the most perfect or accomplished language, Sanskrit. So what we have on uh, very early in history is a sense that beauty is a sacred or divine attribute. Uh, I believe in the Vedas, uh, you can identify with several <coughs> attributes, but in particular with Tejas, you know, that luminosity, that radiance, that overwhelming um, light. Uh, some of the earliest, one of the earliest speakers has alluded to Pratipa. And that is one thing which uh, essentially characterizes uh, the concept of uh, radiant beauty which exceeds uh, all definitions, but which overwhelms us. And this is why I chose this image, because there is this sort of perfect poise and perfect harmony, uh, which uh, at the same time reflects the human condition in the form of the body, uh, Rupa, but it also alludes to this suprasensorial balance, the rhythm. Now, if you look at the West, what's very interesting, and I will be very brief about this, is that for many centuries, beauty was seen as an absolute. It was a property of things in themselves, whether or not you were looking at them or whether you were perceiving them, they were still there. Uh, you know, the very old question is, is beauty beautiful because we perceive it, because it pleases us, or does it please us because it is beauty? And generally, uh, Augustine of Hippo, among others, following Plato, said, beauty is beauty, and that's why it pleases us. However, this changed precisely around the 17th, 18th century with the discovery of aesthetics as a theory, where it was alleged that basically beauty is what pleases us, and therefore it's quite subjective. And depending upon where we live, how educated we are, what language we speak, you know, in what era we are, uh, in what time of history we live, beauty will be perceived very differently. For example, in the 17th century in Europe, there was a platonic view of beauty that beauty relied on perfect proportions, perfect forms, and symmetry. And therefore, wild nature was frightening and it was often alluded to as horrible. Of course, horrible can also be part of beauty, as we know, it's one of the nine rasas, you know. The, so we cannot uh, essentially say that it has been ruled out, but there was still that very acute perception that beauty had to be polished, it had to be developed, in other words, it had to be Sanskrit. 
However, by the late 18th century, the optics changed, and we find Romanticism saying that wild nature is the most beautiful, and uh, things done by humans generally miss that essential essence, that essential quality, uh, which, uh, of course, is what we find in communion with nature, the return to the source, you know, the, the mula prakriti, as it were. And as a result, you can see that evolution in, 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 uh, in the taste. And uh, Kant, among others, argued about how taste is the result of education, and you cannot judge taste as such, because uh, everybody has their own. And even though there are some criteria which seem to be fairly general, it's not easy to make them acceptable to all, because what seems gaudy to someone will appear very bright and luminous and beautiful to someone else. I think that the reason why Western aesthetics was such a disputed and subjective concept is because they lost sight of the source, of the essence, of the avyakta, and therefore it became a matter of pleasing the senses. There was no concept of ananda, because ananda was relegated to a religious experience and therefore was no longer acceptable in the secular world. Therefore, what you had was essentially an ability to please the senses, but that, of course, is one of the problems with beauty, because beauty by itself, if you appreciate beauty for itself, then it shouldn't be a matter of self-interest. You shouldn't like it because you think you can make a lot of money by selling it, which is the problem with much of modern art. Or you shouldn't like it because you think you can own it and it becomes part of you and you can impress everybody else. It should be appreciated as an emotion. And that's where rasa is so important as the fundamental notion, as essentially both the reflection and the source of bhava, you know, of the value of bhava. And uh, if you look, for example, at this other modern Indian painting, which very clearly reflects uh, is, is both, the, you know, you can see it as the third eye, you can see it as the sun. The concept of radiance, the concept of tejas, the concept of arkas is very present, even though it's what you might almost call an abstract painting. It reminds you of uh, astronomical photographs that have been taken in some certain galactic formations. And at the same time, it has a deep metaphysical allusion. And it is completely dissociated from sensual pleasure in the sense that we uh, normally understand. You know, sensual pleasure is something such as food or such as uh, a beautiful touch or a nice smell, which uh, essentially makes you feel good and evokes in you certain images. That's a suggestion, you know, the Dvani. Uh, that's where we get into Ananda Vargana's uh, theory of Dvani. But there is, of course, the Shanta, there is the Shringara, and contrary to the Greeks, in India, there was, as was said by Professor Pat, I believe, the very clear distinction between prayas and treyas. Whereas in Greece, and therefore in the West, there were these two views. The prevalent view was that beauty is good. You know, kalos is agathos. By the way, kalos is kala. But kalos is beautiful in Greek, whereas it's art in Sanskrit, which you might say is almost a synonym, but not quite. On the other hand, there are those who say, well, beauty is not necessarily uh, good. There can be some, almost, you might say, heavy beauty, or at least monstrous beauty. And therefore, you have to beware of beauty, because what if beauty induces you into temptation to commit the wrong actions? For example, what if the beauty of a woman carries you to misbehave with her? Is that, therefore, a desirable, or at least is it a, you know, essentially ac morally acceptable? Or is it rather a trap, you know, and that's where the whole notion of the possible devilish temptation that creeps into beauty, you know, and, and this has been a very powerful factor in Western aesthetics, to the point that by the late 19th century, early 20th century, a number of philosophers, especially Santayana, decided that beauty was essentially an illusion of your senses, because it was either related to your biological um, evolutionary urge, essentially what was beautiful, it was, was convenient. It was because it was healthy or because it gave you a sense of uh, enhancement of your abilities. And therefore, 
art should look beyond beauty because uh, there was something that was not necessarily codified by beautiful criteria. And as a result, you can see 20th century art becoming more and more dissociated from beauty and looking for very different things, uh, which uh, in some cases has produced interesting experiments, but in other cases has also led to some rather uh, dramatically ugly creations. And yet we are supposed to accept them because if you say, I don't find this is beautiful, you are told that you don't understand it. And uh, this is uh, much more intelligent than you are, and you have to be a scholar to really get it, you know, which is why they explain it in great, at great length. And there are many foreign, I mean, contemporary artists who are actually cultivating ugliness. Uh, Lucien Freud is a very good example. A lot of paintings of Picasso can uh, be uh, essentially attributed to the same uh, intention. And I could go on and on in architecture, in dance, in music, um, you know, the breaking of the uh, traditional scales and of the notions of harmony. All that is essentially rooted in a overall rejection of beauty as such. Now, here you have a, an example of beauty which is sensual and yet sacred. There is a sensuality which is uh, at the same time not um, literal because it, it shows a plenitude and it shows the richness, the abundance, uh, and again, it reflects a particular rasa uh, and perhaps even more than one. So again, you see the flexibility of the Indian concept of beauty which hasn't become entrapped in a particular set of notions. Now here, of course, you have the fear, the, the bhaya, you know, which uh, is clearly also related to a form of sacredness, and then therefore which can be also associated with uh, a, a particular beauty which evokes a particular bhava, and therefore which is part of enjoyment, just as when you watch a tragedy or you listen to a particularly uh, powerful and somewhat disturbing kind of music. Uh, again, the grace, the dreaminess, the sort of dematerialization of uh, both nature and humanity, or human, the human shape, the human form, is what you find in a lot of uh, paintings of the traditional school, of course, both in East and West, but the very uh, strict and yet flexible criteria that have prevailed in India have all along been inspired by rasa, whereas my contention is that Western art lost the sense of rasa by the, let's say, the middle of the 19th century. When, and, and it coincides with a period of increased technological development, uh, rising uh, bellicosity, increasing means of destruction, uh, and the beginning of uh, environmental uh, pollution and destruction. So you have a clear relation between the loss of uh, the balance with nature, the sense of rhythm, and the invasion of very, I would say, subjective and very personal views of what should be shown, what can be enjoyed, and what is actually valuable not necessarily in terms of beauty anymore, but in terms of, for example, the shock or the, in, the, the surprise it provokes. Now, if you look at, for example, the traditional Indian jewelry such as this, you will see that it evokes presently what science has rediscovered in uh, the Mandelbrot sets. And I will show you a Mandelbrot set soon, but uh, those of you who come from a scientific background know, of course, that the Mandelbrot sets are a particular uh, illustration of the, uh, the, the geometry of fractals. And fractals characterize nature. Nature is built around fractals. And of course, perhaps the best known uh, equation that defines fractals is what we call in the West the Fibonacci number, which was uh, first found perhaps by Pingala, uh, which is obviously what we also call the golden ratio. And I don't think it's a coincidence that when we call it a ratio, ratio is derived from rhythm. So you see here a commonality between East and West. Now, this is an example of a contemporary Western painting, which, uh, sorry, contemporary Indian painting, which shows that even in a purely abstract form, just by light and color, you can create an emotion 
which is harmonious and which is pleasant. Uh, people will perceive it in different ways. It will be energizing for some. It will be uh, sumptuous for others. But the fact is that there is that uh, rasa and that beauty which is independent of forms. Uh, so essentially, again, the task of taking you from the diakta to the adyakta is what beauty is uh, all about. That is what, what art essentially teaches and what art makes us capable of doing. Now this I have chosen randomly because it was recently an exhibition at the National Museum in Delhi. It's a Peruvian 17th century painting. And it shows an angel. Now, as you notice, the angel is dressed like the great lord of the 17th century in Europe, or particularly in Spain at the time. And it's an interesting uh, reflection of how a concept of beauty is attached both to a culture, because this is very clearly a cultural way of dressing and, and looking, but it is also a universal sense of beauty, because clearly anybody who looks at it would see it as a beautiful, as a very lavish, as a very uplifting uh, representation of the human form. You know, there is that uh, sense of, as it were, sublimity about it, even though it is magnificent. But that's where magnificence merges with a, a sense of what transcends the human condition and yet partakes of it. Now, I'm getting into the more scientific aspect of it because what's very interesting is that after almost a hundred years of neglecting beauty, beauty has made a comeback through science. And this will be my last chapter. Why? Because a number of scientists discovered that equations to be useful, because we cannot say they are right ultimately, but to be useful needed to be beautiful or elegant. So there was a notion that science is not independent of beauty. And this is obviously what goes back to the root of rasa, because rasa is, is taste, you know, and therefore, uh, you know, rasama spadiate. So essentially, the taste, whether you eat or whether you smell or whether you see, uh, is something that is the essence of a particular thing. And therefore, through the rasa, you end up communing with creation. And that leads you step by step to the essence inside nature. Now, this is a microscopic photography of the pattern of a cauliflower. But if you look at any plant, flower, or rock, you will find that these patterns are exquisitely chiseled and they are perfectly symmetrical. Even if you take a you know, particular uh, recording of the phenomenon, of the sonic phenomenon provoked by an earthquake, you will see that it's a perfect Fibonacci spiral, which essentially means that the earthquake obeys to the rule of cosmic harmony, and yet there is hardly anything more disruptive than an earthquake, which seems utter chaos, and yet chaos is thoroughly regulated. This is what uh, physics and mathematics have both shown in the last 40 years, more or less. So, you know, the Julia sets, the Mandelbrot sets. So what you have here is, of course, a vision of nature, as it is at the microscopic <coughs> level, but, and you can, it evokes a forest of conifers. You know, you could see that there are trees. It's just a matter of scales. You know, but they are essentially in the same uh, order. Now, this is one of the more complex Mandelbrot sets that has been created by a computer, and it's infinite because, as far as you go, the same patterns are repeated in a spiralic form. So it's essentially like a vortex, but uh, it shows that the repetition of the same formula, the same algebraic formula, will lead to this endless repetition of harmony, which has led some scientists to theorize that beauty can be defined as order within complexity. Essentially, if you have an immanent order within complexity, then you are achieving the closest to what can be called a general definition or understanding of beauty. And now I will probably uh, go into uh, the most controversial and one of the most actual aspects of uh, the beauty paradigm which is the ability to create beauty not by human intelligence, but by computers. Because this was a painting created by a robot uh, working on the basis of uh, uh, deep learning and artificial intelligence. So there is a controversy about how nice this is. But remember, this is the very beginning of it. So it was created a few weeks ago.
and there was no human intervention. The only thing that was done is that the computer was given a lot of images to look at, going right from the oldest forms of art, Neolithic and Indus Valley, to uh, contemporary uh, paintings, and then and photographs, and then it was essentially made to think about how it would like to represent a woman. And then it was given full freedom. Nobody corrected it or told him this is how you should, you know, it was completely the robot's intelligence working. Which means what? Which means that the robot, if it starts connecting to the cosmic mind, you know, to the cheetah, it can start learning what we have learned over the centuries. And uh, there is, of course, in the West, which is very much connected to the divine sense of individual soul, saying, no, that's not possible because a computer doesn't have a soul, and therefore, how can it create a human-like uh, uh, work of art? Well, that's not part of the Indian tradition, because in the Eastern tradition, in particular in the Indian tradition, Chitta is a cosmically spread out essence. Therefore, any mechanism which can tap into it could learn not only the sciences and the techniques, but also the arts that we have. Now, the question is to educate, and that's where education, that's where, you know, the whole concept of Atma Sanskriti comes in. Because if you give a particular person or a particular computer the wrong notions, you are probably going to have a very uh, disruptive and very disturbing art coming out. You know what's called uh, Abhwa in some cases, what is Abhu, what is not really because it's not part of the rhythm. Therefore, it is not within the Dharma. And as a result, uh, what we have to do, if we are going to go ahead, which is inevitable, into more and more artificial intelligence-led society, then we should definitely instill the right dharma. We should instill the rhythm into the software. Because otherwise, you will go, we'll have more and more monstrous creations. And uh, unfortunately, they will escape our control. So that's where I probably would like to leave you uh, saying that uh, essentially we have to worldwide tap into the notion of rasa and through that rediscover the essence of art and the very, I would say, immanent character and the transcendent character of beauty as a guide, as a path to Ananda, to the discovery of uh, the Supreme, of Paramatma. Thank you, sir. May the Vedic philosophy of aesthetics for my Acha Pakta Prasut Kyans may make Sondar Sastra ko question Sondar Sastra Joda or Amikudhan Indian painting or microscopy photography 